This past week, I heard, this, I heard a pretty powerful story about God's Word that I want to share with you. It was shared by Francis Chan, uh, and he's telling the stories of 10 missionaries that were from Korea that were in Afghanistan a few years ago. And of the 10 missionaries, five of them uh, lived. The others were martyred and, uh, because they were freed by the military. Before the first missionary was killed, they took a poll amongst them which one was going to die first. And literally, it turned into an argument about which one was going to die first because one said, well, I'm a pastor, so I'm going to go first. And the other one said, I'm a pastor too, and I'm older than you, so I'm your elder. I'm going to go first. And they said, but I'm ordained. And literally, this conversation went back and forth, and, and uh, they eventually gave their lives. Uh, uh, the Taliban took their lives. And uh, one of the missionaries who lived was telling the story that of this group of missionaries, one of, only one of them uh, was able to smuggle a Bible through the process. And they, they took the pages of the Bible and they ripped them uh, into pages and separated them uh, amongst the missionaries. Now, the Taliban had them in, in pits, in, in cells, in very confined places, not very humane circumstances at all. And fast forward, uh, some time later, they were freed. Some of them were freed, some of them died. And one of them was sharing that even after they were free and they were back and back in modern life, back in modern conveniences, they said, I long for the days to be back in the pit with those pages of the Bible because I was never as close to God as I was then. That's amazing. And, and I share that story to tell you that not that who wants to go to a pit in Afghanistan with the Taliban. I'm not saying that, but I, I think that story illustrates is that the, our relationship with God is very much defined by our relationship with the Bible. We are as close to God in many ways as we are as close to this book. This is a living, breathing book, right? It's not just literature. It's the living, active, powerful Word of God. And so why are we studying how to study the Bible? Because it is, it is everything to our relationship with God. Nod your head if you're with me so far. And so that's why we have been taking this time uh, to put God's Word in the center of our lives. Because if God's Word becomes the center of our life, guess what? Jesus is the center of our lives. And so that's why it's so, so important. So if you're sitting on the, on the fence, you say, hey, I can't wait for this to be over. Uh, no, 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 no. It's never going to be over. All right. We're always going to be talking about this because it's huge. So thank God for that. Last week, we talked about the four parts to Bible study. Remember, we talked about observation. What does it say? Interpretation. What does it mean? Correlation. What are the verses? Explain it. Application. What will I do about it? If you take your notes in your, in your bulletin and follow along here this morning, today, our uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into interpretation. Uh, how do we understand the meaning of a text? How do we understand what the Bible is saying? And we're going to begin today by reading John chapter 15, a very personal conversation that Jesus has with his disciples before he's arrested and before he dies. As we head into Easter season here in a few weeks, this is a very appropriate passage for us to, to, to think about. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to understand why some people say Scripture means one thing and other people say the same Scripture means something completely different. How many know there are some rules of interpretation? that we need to follow if we're, going to be, if we're going to be responsible about all of these things. Uh, how many have ever heard somebody say this? God doesn't expect me to be successful. He only expects me to be faithful. I've heard some people say that, right? God doesn't expect us to be successful. He only expects us to be faithful. Well, uh, let me, let me uh, correct you by saying God does expect us to be fruitful, not just faithful, fruitful. Let's look at this. John chapter 15, verse 1. Pastor Phil's going to tag team with me today. We're, and together we're going to share the, the, uh, uh, the rules of interpretation for Scripture. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Look at how many times the word fruit is in these, in these verses. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
remain in me and I will remain in you, no branch can bear what? Fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. I'm, I'm thinking fruit's the main idea here so far, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words, uh, you ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's what disciples do. Disciples bear fruit, right? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. And by the way, again, this sets Christianity apart from every other faith system in the rest of the world. God came to heaven to be your friend. Amazing. Uh, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love one another. Now, using these verses from John, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what happens if you ignore the rules of interpretation? Because the Bible doesn't mean 10 different things. It means one thing. Now, there may be a multitude of applications into our lives, but the Bible doesn't mean three things at one time. It means one thing. And so if we don't know the rules of interpretation, you can make the Bible say anything. Pay attention. But I, I talked a little bit about this last week. We live in an age of soundbite theology, okay? Little three or four words at a time. Social networking, Facebook, uh, Twitter, you know, that's how we communicate. We communicate in short soundbites. And as a result, people use the Bible to back up whatever they think they believe. It's called proof texting, okay? So if you don't know the rules of interpretation, you can make the Bible say just about anything. Do I have your attention yet? Okay, because this is happening all the time, and it confuses people who aren't paying attention, and, and it causes people to lose faith in the Word of God, lose faith in the church, because they're, they are thinking, well, so-and-so says blah, 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 you know, and, and especially people who are attacking the authority of God's Word, well, didn't in the Bible it say blah, 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 and they take everything out of context, they don't interpret it at all, and yet we don't know the rules of interpretation, so we say, wow, we must be a bunch of nincompoops. No, you're not the nincompoop. Did I? I didn't say it. I just mouthed it. All right. Now, here's the verse that, that tends to get misinterpreted. Verse 6. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, I've heard some preachers say, now what this verse means is that the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. And so if a Christian doesn't win another person to Christ, they go to hell. I've heard some people say that. Now, uh, is that what this verse means? Let's keep going. Let's look. Here's, let, let's give, me and Pastor Phil are going to give you four rules of Bible interpretation. Number one, if you're going to interpret the Bible correctly, you need to consider the historical context. Everybody say context. The context is who is being spoken to and why. And so when we read a scripture from the Bible, we have to ask the question, what did it mean to them? Who is God talking to? Why is he saying it? And what does it mean? Because how many know when we take things out of context, we can change the meaning? When we take words out of context, we can change the meaning. I've got a couple of illustrations here for you. Uh, the phrases that without context can, the, 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 it's just not the same. The book Understanding Women has finally arrived in stores. 
Now that's a statement, but look at, look at the context. I mean, this is a little bit different. I'm just saying. All right, here's the next one. Just let me drink my coffee and no one will get hurt. Now that's a, that's a great statement, but when you see the context, it's a little bit different. What about this next one here? Um, don't step on it. It makes you cry. Look at this context. <laughs> now, when it comes to Scripture, watch this. People take the verbiage, but they don't take the context, which provides the picture. In all of these illustrations, the picture provided the context for the words. Are you getting this? And so when we don't take the time to read the scriptures before and the after, the historical context, who, who, is he, who is he talking to, what did it mean to them, then we are taking the words without the pictures and trying to understand it. How many know you need the picture to help understand the words, right? And so in order to get the context for John 15, we need to look at the verses before and the verses after. Now in John 13 and John 14 and John 15 and John 16 and 17, guess what? They're all part of the same conversation. In John 13, remember, Jesus takes his disciples to the upper room. He washes their feet. They were a little bit moved by that, right? That he had communion with them, which we're going to do in a few minutes at the end of this service. And, and, and he said, this, he, says, he says, I'm making you clean. And Peter says, oh, Lord, not me. And he goes, if I don't do it, you're not part of me. And Peter says, then give me a bath. You know, that whole conversation. Uh, th these are some of the last words of Jesus to his disciples. In John 14, remember, Jesus makes the pro a number of promises to them. He says, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it weren't so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Isn't that good? I mean, th these are some intimate words that he is sharing with his followers. And, and then at the end of John 14, remember, uh, he, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming and he says, I'm going to give you peace and don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. And at verse 31 of John 14, he says, come now, let's leave this place. So at the end of John 14, uh, they leave the upper room and guess where they go? They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so they leave, uh, Jerusalem's up on a hill, they go down in a valley, back up to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is also on another hill, and as they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, they are passing through the olive groves of Jerusalem, the vineyards. And Jesus gives the illustration of the vine and the branches on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he uses this very visible, very real object lesson to say, I am the vine you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Amen. Are you getting this? So we see that the context of the conversation is not evangelism whatsoever. It's about prayer. It's about our ongoing relationship with God. Nod your head if you're with me. I'm going to skip some things because of time and pass it right back to Pastor Phil. He's going to come and share uh, the second and third principle of interpretation. Make Pastor Phil welcome as he comes to share. All right. Hey, the second principle of interpretation is this. You must define the key word. You must define the key words. If you're going to get the right meaning of a Bible verse, you've got to make sure that you understand what the word means and not what you think it means. Okay, Pastor Wayne will expand on this a little bit more uh, shortly. But do you realize the same single word can have several different meanings? The same word, a lot, of the, a lot of different meanings. Let me explain this way. Uh, if you have a husband or a wife, just look over at him just for a second. Have you ever had an argument with this person because you both used the same word but meant something completely different? Okay, you're laughing because it never happens to you, but to me, all the time. Like every day is something new. Let me tell you something. You can use the same words, but many words have multiple meanings. I remember, um, this was years ago, after a youth service, uh, we had a visitor that was checking things out. 
Uh, he came up to me and he said, the night was sick. <laughs> now some of you that are probably over 50 are thinking what I thought at the moment. I started to think the definition of sick is what I was feeling as he walked away. In reality, over time, I found out what he meant in his context. It was incredible. You see, the same words can have multiple meanings. You can't just assume you know what the meaning of a word is. Words have multiple meanings. Let me show you a few more examples. The word band means a thin strip for binding. Okay, a group of musicians, a ring of elastic, or to gather together. It's the same word, but different meanings. The context determines what it really means. Okay, what about if we use the word batter? You might be talking about the liquid used to make a cake, or you might be talking about a baseball player, the batter. How about if we use the word choke? You might be talking about gagging on a large substance in your throat, or we could be talking about the cubs again. So, <laughs> I can see I have new friends. Sorry, Mike. Did you know that the word pin, P-I-N, in the English has 62 different meanings? That one word, 62 meanings. It can mean a stiff piece of wire with a sharp point, a baking roller pin, a bowling pin. How about the four-digit number for your debit or credit card, the pin number? We could be talking about wrestling, throwing somebody down to pin them. Okay, we could go on and on about all these different meanings, but... The thing I want you to understand is the same word can have multiple meanings. So you really can't assume what you think it might be. In this particular passage in John 15, the word love is used nine times, and the word fruit is also used nine times in just these 17 verses. Most of us would figure out what love is, but what is fruit? What is fruit? Most of us would figure you know, that they could, you know, it's, it's either this or that. But let me show you through Scripture that there's 44, 44 times in the New Testament where the word fruit was used. And it has at least 10 different meanings. Let me show you in the Scriptures here. In Matthew 3, 8, the word fruit is used for the fruit of repentance. Repentance. In Matthew 26, 29, it talks about the fruit of the vine. What it's actually talking about is communion. The grape juice, the wine. In Romans 7, 5, it talks about uh, we bore fruit for death. It's talking about the sinful lifestyle. Remember, this is all the same word. Romans 15, 18, we receive this fruit. It's talking about an offering of money. That's the fruit. Galatians 5, 22, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And we all know that's the nine godly attitudes. And then we look in Ephesians 5, 9. It talks about the fruit of life, which is truth, righteousness, and goodness. Colossians 1, 6, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. It's talking about new believers. And in Hebrews 13, 15, it talks about praise to God, the fruit of our lips. It's talking about praise. That's the fruit. Same word, a lot of different meanings. So let me ask you this. What does it mean in this context? What is Jesus saying when he's talking about remain in me so you'll bear fruit? In order to truly understand that, you got to understand this third principle of interpretation. And it's this, I must interpret unclear verses with clear ones. I must interpret unclear verses with clear ones. In John 15, we find three clear characteristics of fruit. And we can find them in verses 4, 8, and 11. Let's check them out. In verse 4, it says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Now, we mentioned this earlier. Remain means to stay, to abide, to continue, to connect, to last. The Greek word, it actually means meno. That's the Greek word for it. And it, and it means to stay connected. So a branch that's disconnected from a tree is not going to bear any fruit, it's got to stay connected or it'll never bear any fruit. That's all he's saying. Be connected to me and, and you'll be fruitful. 
It goes on to say, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So if you're doing a Bible study and you're observing this scripture, this is what you would probably write down first through this scripture. Bearing fruit is produced by remaining in Christ. Bearing fruit is produced by remaining in Christ. That's not an exaggeration. That's not reading into the text. It's pretty clear. He says it three times. If you stay in me, you're going to bear fruit. If you don't, you're not. If you don't stay in me, you cannot do anything. Okay? So the first thing that we learn is bearing fruit is produced by remaining in Christ. What does that mean? It means fruit is an inside job. Let me illustrate it this way for you. Pretend that you are a tree. And let's say you're a barren tree. No leaves on it. Completely barren. And you want to bear fruit, so you go and you start tying apples to this tree. And then you say, look, I'm bearing apples to my tree. It doesn't work that way, but in Christianity, many of us try to do that. We have no fruit in our life, but we try to do good works to make it look as if we are bearing fruit. But it's an inside job. And that's when Christ is saying the Holy Spirit is what will bear through, fruit through you. Okay? But moving on, verse 8. It says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So this is the second thing I'd write down. Bearing fruit brings glory to God. Bearing fruit brings glory to God. So at this point, we can see this. There's nothing tricky about this, this last one. But we should be able to see that bearing fruit produces, when it produces, uh, I'm sorry. Bearing fruit is produced by remaining in Christ. It brings glory to God. Then in verse 11, we can see this third characteristic. It says, I've told you this, Jesus says, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So what's this last thing that we can observe? Bearing fruit will give me complete joy. Bearing fruit will give me complete joy. I think if you read within the context now, you can understand what Jesus is meaning by fruit. And I'm going to let Pastor Wayne go ahead and take over because he's going to wrap this up real nicely with this last point. Give it up for Pastor Phil. Great job. So we know that you can't bear fruit apart from Christ. Why are we doing 40 days in the Word? Because we're trying to remain in Christ. We're trying to cultivate a relationship with Christ. And out that inside job produces real fruit. Okay? So now it comes to the fourth point. What, what is the fruit? What, what does that mean? What, is it evangelism? Is it something else? Well, the fourth rule of interpretation is look for the most obvious meaning. Look for the most obvious meaning. The, the, this is the exact opposite of what people want to do, right? They don't want to look for the most obvious meaning. They want to look for the deep hidden things in the Bible, right? Uh, 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 if you go looking for the deep things in the Bible, you know what you're going to miss a lot of times? The obvious things in the Bible. It's like Mark Twain said, it's not the things that I don't understand in the Bible that bother me. It's the things I do understand in the Bible that, that bother me. Okay, now let me, let me help you out with a little bit. And if I'm going to ruffle your feathers, I love you anyway. There are no secrets in the Bible. There's no hidden code. No mysteries. Listen, God, why would God choose to reveal himself in this book and then hide in it? This is the revelation of God, God's heart, God's character. And we get into trouble, right, uh, when we try to look for the hidden things in the Bible, okay? If you ever come up with an interpretation of the Bible that no one else has ever seen, you're wrong. If somebody's on Christian television saying, I'm going to share something that no one's ever seen before, turn the channel, run the opposite way, because they are wrong. Are you with me so far? Now listen, if it's new, it's not true. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's been around forever and ever. 
It was true a thousand years ago. It'll be true a thousand years from now because God's word stands for how long? Forever, right? Many years ago, uh, some of you remember uh, in, in prophecy areas, uh, there was this book about Henry Kissinger. He was the Secretary of State way back when. And they said that if you assign a certain number to each letter of the alphabet, and then you take Henry Kissinger's name, it spells Antichrist. And that meant that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. Now you say, Pastor, that's crazy. I remember people talking about this when I was younger. Henry Kissinger's the Antichrist because of the, it's in the Bible. That's called eisegesis, not exegesis. Exegesis is pulling truth from the Bible. Eisegesis is reading stuff into the Bible. Okay, exegesis is what we're trying to do. And so we, if we're going to understand the Bible, we got to look for the most obvious meaning. Okay, so how does this apply uh, to John 15? Well, uh, the scripture, Jesus said, if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be thrown into the fire. Okay, so the word for fire here is not Gehenna or Sheol or another word for hell. It just simply means fire. So what's obvious about verse six, if anyone doesn't remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire fire and burn. So what, what's he talking about here? The most obvious meaning, especially based on context, he's not talking about evangelism. He's talking about prayer. Are you with me? He's talking about prayer. Let's see why he's talking about prayer. Verse 5, chapter 15, verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Now that means that if I remain in Christ, that produces answered prayer. If you remain in me, you can ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Are you kidding me? Whatever? That's a powerful word. Whatever you ask in my name. Do you understand that the quality of the answer to your prayers is directly related to your remaining in Christ, your relationship with Christ? The quality of your prayer life will have everything to do with the fruit that you bear. The quality of your prayer life will have everything to do with the fruit that you bear. The quality of your prayer life will have everything to do with the fruit that you bear. The quality of your prayer... Uh, I'm going to keep going until you get this, all right? And part of the fruit that you bear is answered prayer. Look at chapter 14, verse 13. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. There it is again. And we learn that answered prayer brings glory to God. Right? If we, if we are remaining in Christ, the Bible says that, that we can ask whatever in his name and it will bring glory to the Father. That just shows that God wants to answer your prayer. God wants to answer your prayer. I'm repeating myself. It's like I'm on skip. God wants to answer your prayer. We, we struggle with God and we, and we ask God because we don't, and, and we're trying to bear fruit apart from Him. But how many know when we get in trouble, boy, I'm calling the prayer time. You know, I'm praying. And we treat prayer like this emergency response system rather than a part of, of cultivating an everyday life with Jesus, which will result in answered prayer that brings glory to God. Not your head of you with me. Okay, chapter 16, verse 24. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now, I want you to notice that all through this conversation, he's talking about bearing fruit. And all through this conversation, he's talking about asking whatever you wish in my name. Answered prayer gives me complete joy. James chapter 4, verse 2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. God loves to answer our prayers. Did you know that God never shuts his storehouse until you shut your mouth? I'd be writing that one down. God never shuts his storehouse until you shut your mouth. You don't have because you don't ask. We don't have because we don't ask. When I don't pray, watch this, I'm not cheating God. I'm cheating myself. When I don't pray and I don't talk to God, uh, I'm not cheating God, I'm cheating myself. Because everything good comes from prayer, right? You remain in me, I'll remain in you, and you'll bear much fruit. It's like having this huge bank account that you can draw from and never go into the bank. 
never withdrawing from this stuff that God has for you. Now, just in case you haven't gotten this yet, Jesus ends uh, this in chapter 16 with verse 16. Watch this. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Is he talking about people who don't uh, win other people to Jesus go to hell? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about prayer and bearing fruit. Now, remember, they were on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane while this conversation is taking place. Do you remember what happened at the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus went a little bit farther away to... And he came back and he was a little concerned because instead of praying, they were sleeping. And he said, could you not tarry with me just one hour? He said, guys, I just spent the last few hours talking about fruit and prayer and asking whatever you want. You thought I was talking about 10 years from now. I'm talking about right now. I bear fruit by asking in prayer. Prayer is the root of all fruit. Prayer is the root of all. If you get this, your life will be changed. Now tonight in our small groups, we're going to learn about another method of studying the Bible called pray it. Oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be really good. How do I take what I'm studying and turn it into a prayer? You do not want to miss tonight in your small group because prayer is the root of all fruit. Every good thing in your life is going to come through your prayer life. Somebody say amen. And if we ever get this, we're going to understand God is waiting, 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 waiting with this storehouse of treasure and blessing and anointing through prayer. And if we'll pray, we'll get it. Last last Tuesday morning, We're sitting here. We pray every Tuesday morning at 6.30 here at the church. Pastor Jason was leading the prayer time, and and I'm back there in the back, and I'm praying. And and we have this faithful, faithful group of folks who come. You know, there's about 20 or 25 of us, and and, and that's great. I'm I'm not down that at all. But this thought hit me. If we ever, ever, ever get this, if we ever get it in our spirit, get it through our thick head, if we will just pray, what in the world could happen in this church? What, what kind of power, what kind of anointing, what kind of miracles, what kind of salvations, what kind of harvest, what kind of outpouring of the Holy Ghost would happen if we would just pray, if we would just ask, if we would just show up in our, prayer, in our quiet times, in our prayer times, and say, Lord, would you? And he'll say, yes, Amen. if we pray. Amen. Listen, if... If you don't pray, you're not going to have any fruit in your life. It's like Pastor Phil said, you're trying to take apples and hang them on a dead tree. You'll fake everybody out for a while, but pretty soon it'll be fairly clear. Listen, the more you pray, the more fruit you'll have in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. The more you pray, the more you remain in him, the more fruit you'll have in your life. Nod your head if you're with me. Are you getting this? It goes for the church, it goes for your family, it goes for you. Pastor Steve, if you'd come help me, we're getting ready to receive communion. So ushers, if you would be ready to do that. In Matthew chapter 7, let's bring this to a close. Remember, we've talked about this verse pretty much every week. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. If I take what I learned today about prayer, the Bible says I'm pretty smart. I'm a wise man. And my house is built on the rock. And when the meteors start falling from the sky, (laughs) who saw that one coming? Instead of us being shaken, we'll be solid. Are you getting this? This is not just some exercise and whatever. This is, this is huge. This is critical for the coming days that we are going to be experiencing in the world. The Bible says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And the people who are going to endure are the people whose lives are centered around this book. It really is that easy. It really is. You're like a wise man 
who built your house on the rock because you didn't just hear the words, you did it. But if I don't do something about it, the Bible says I'm a fool. Problem is today that people all over America are listening to a sermon that they have no intention of doing anything about. Do I have your attention yet? Our problem with our culture and our understanding of Christianity is that we're listening to a sermon and we have no intention of doing anything about it. We make the service about a hundred other things instead of what God is saying to you to do. People say, but pastor, I want deep stuff. I want some deep teaching. They think deep teaching is explaining the symbolism of everything in the Old Testament and this, that, or the other. Listen, the deepest teaching is the teaching that changes your character. The deepest preaching is the preaching that changes your attitude. It changes your spirit. It changes your behavior. Because if it doesn't change you, it's shallow. You can fill your mind with every Bible fact and every deep Bible background you want to and know all the doctrine in the Bible, but if you're still cranky and you gossip and you swear and you treat your wife and your kids poorly and you watch porn on TV and you're unethical at work, you're not deep at all. Deep has nothing to do with it. God wants us to follow through. God doesn't want us just to be an expert in the Bible. He wants it to get through us. And when we remain in Him, it changes us. When I open this book and it breathes on me and I, and I pray through it, something happens on the inside of me. I start bearing fruit. And instead of trying to be godly, I'm training to be godly. Oh, that's good. Instead of just giving all my effort to overcome and, and try, I'm just going to try harder, Pastor. I'm just going, no, 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 stop trying. Start cultivating. Start hoeing your row. Start putting some seeds in the ground. Start spreading some fertilizer. Water that puppy. It's called the Bible. And then pretty soon, the fruit will begin to manifest in your life. And people say, who's that dude? I don't recognize him. He looks a little different. You getting this? If you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. Now the question is, what area of your life today needs fruit bearing? Is it your attitude? Is it, is it your relationships at, at your house? Is it your relationships at work? What, what is it? What area of your life needs some fruit bearing? Because whatever that is, that should become your prayer topic. And as you pray about it, you know what's going to happen? You'll start bearing fruit in that area. It really is that simple. So today as we gather around the Lord's table, as we, as we remember the Lord's death and his resurrection, may this be a time of contemplation. Go ahead and ushers and distribute the elements. A time of reflection, a time of remembering, and a time of searching our own hearts, our relationship with God, our relationship with others. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Everyone should hold on to their elements until all have been served, and we'll come and receive them together.